Libby, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. For listeners who are not aware of Libby, Libby is an absolutely amazing dietitian who I met when we were both working at the time at Equipoise Teletherapy. Great place to go uh, if, if you're looking to, to, to get some help. And Libby in particular uh, is mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, but uh, Libby recently has gone full-time into private practice, and I'm really excited to talk with her today about what we don't really know about how to eat properly, uh, because I know that every time I speak with Libby, <laughs> I learn a lot. And so I feel like we could, we could take that and, and continue uh, that trend, both for me, but now for everybody else as well. So Libby, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yes, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, so maybe we could just start with uh, where where you got your start. So you, you have the most amazingly delicious, by the way, looking social media uh, channels. I mean, I'm, I'm astounded. I look at it and I'm like, man, I it takes me back to my time when I was in undergrad, when I was literally uh, heating up a hot dog in a glass of water <laughs> in the microwave because that way it wouldn't get too wrinkly. But like, yes. oh my gosh, like it makes me feel like an absolute caveman. How did you get so interested in food? How did you get so interested in your career? What got you started? Yeah, absolutely. So I always was growing up cooking with my family, always was interested in and kind of, I always played sports growing up. So I always was kind of in more of like a health lifestyle, like pace and whatnot. Um, I went to college and was like, I'm going to study nutrition. I had absolutely no idea like what went into it. I knew I liked science and math versus like English writing type of thing. So I'm going to go for it. Boy, did I not know what I was getting myself into in terms of like science or organic chemistry and all the things that come with that. Um, I learned afterwards there's grad school and internships and all these other things that kind of come into it. You just don't get to learn nutrition and kind of do like whatever with it. Um, so I kind of just kept going with it. I went with it. I did grad school. I was in my dietetic internship, which is where we have to do basically like supervised hours, um, just as like most other healthcare professionals have to. And it wasn't until I was in that doing it and taking like motivational interviewing kind of type courses that I finally like clicked and was like, okay, this is actually what I want to be doing. This is what I thought of when I thought of like nutrition a lot of the other experiences that I had were more like hospital based. You get in, you get out, you give a five quick, five minute quick um, education. You really don't get to know that these individuals, these individuals really could care less really what you're coming unless you're coming to like discharge them if they're in a hospital. Um, and it wasn't until I finally started to go into more of like the mental health and I actually did a, an internship rotation at an eating disorder clinic that I realized that is where I wanted to kind of be in terms of working on nutrition. This was a place where you got to have relationships with individuals. You got to get to know them. You saw them for more than five minutes multiple times throughout the week as well, too. Um, I didn't really know much about like going and being a dietitian in an eating disorder treatment center prior to that, um, but it's something that I definitely learned very quickly a lot about as well, too. Um, I got a job working as a counselor at one as I was studying to kind of do my, um, take my test to become a dietitian. And that's where I kind of really decided like, this is the, the phase I'm gonna go with things. In terms of like the social media side of things, my Instagram started as like my friend and I in college as like a fun way to just post kind of like health things over the summer in between college, just because we were like, what the hell else are we gonna do in this? Um, and I would say between like college and grad school, I, I used it intermittently, would post sometimes, take breaks, kind of come back to it. And I eventually took it over from my, my friend and kind of originally it was called Green Eggs and Dam, kind of like a play on, on words there with the N being Y-U-M. As I decided to come more into like a professional space, kind of looking into more expanding my career is when I kind of changed it to the name Piece of Nutrition as well too. Now what I'm using it as is kind of this place to really have my clients have a place to see like simple, easy recipes. I know that I've been through college, grad school, commuting with work and kind of the life that of how do you eat healthy? How do you still enjoy the foods you have? Kind of have this overall balance and cooking for yourself. All that kind of comes with that. That it's helpful that I've had that experience to be able to help them figure out what are quick lunch ideas? What are quick, easy dinner ideas? What are easy um, convenient breakfast and snack ideas that it's really a place for that, but as well as now kind of this like educational platform and this place for educating society, educating individuals on disordered eating, eating disorder, just like all these myths and things that are really there. 
Um, I would say until like the last year though, it's, I, I kind of laugh thinking about it that I, I, I think I realized like this is where I was meant to be. And this is kind of like what I'm good at, what I'm passionate about that. I think all of those things that I kind of just explained and kind of went through my life fell into place and kind of landed me in, in where I am now. Yeah. So it's, it's really been, it sounds like uh, a lifelong pursuit where things started, yeah. started early, less professionally, but, but the shift definitely. Up- it kind of reminds me, I, I know that I, I started thinking I might want to be a psychologist when it felt like when I was a kid that like my friends talked to me about their problems. And I had no yeah. idea that that really doesn't map on to being a psychologist really at all. I mean, well, like that's, that's maybe like the very yeah. like, smallest part, <laughs> but oh my goodness, like things, things are actually quite a bit more than that. Uh, but, um, the but basics yeah, that, are there. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the basics are there. Well, I, I think it's fantastic what you're doing, and I, 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 I'm saying I'm looking at your social media uh, and and feeling shame, but I'm actually joking. It's actually really inspiring. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's, I, I hope that it's inspiring because that is my goal. And you would not be the first person that is like, "How the hell do you do this?" I feel so like guilty and shameful when I'm sitting here eating like a peanut butter and jelly or hot dogs or mac and cheese. That's kind of there as well too. That you are not the first to feel that way. Absolutely. Well, you know, like guilt can be a therapeutic tool, right? You can be like, look at what you could be. I'm just joking. Guilt is not a thing. <laughs> that, is, that is not the intention. No, it's a Inspiration. piece to bring into therapy. <laughs> but yeah, maybe not to, to get more heaped on while you're there. Um, right. Well, all right. Well, let's, let's dive into the actual r- real content of what I want to talk with you about today around nutrition, around food, because I feel like there's a lot of quote unquote common knowledge or fads mm-hmm that we might think about just uh, th- those of us lay people who are not dietitians, where you might be able to at least point us in the general right direction. And I want to start with uh, diets and diet trends, because I know this mm-hmm. is a topic uh, that you're passionate about. You mentioned on your website, uh, it's, it's something that you're, you're very, you're very much against actually, it sounds like diets in general, Atkins, paleo, uh, intermittent fasting in general. Could you talk to us a little bit about why you're, you're less a fan of dieting maybe also mm-hmm. then why they're so attractive to people, why they persist, mm-hmm. and then what alternative ways there are, like what what's another choice? Absolutely, and I wanna clarify a little, I'm not against diets when there's like a medical need or there's an allergy or there's a specific reason for there being it. I'm more against kind of these ideas of what we call these fad diets, these things such as all the ones you named, the Atkins, the keto, which are pretty similar, intermittent fasting, juice cleanses, all that kind of comes with that as well too. And really what, what and why myself and, and other similar dietitians in, you know, this, what we call anti-diet culture that we're kind of in is trying to help people understand that these are all things that a lot of these, for example, such as the keto diet were created as diets for individuals who struggle with epilepsy. So a lot of these have been researched, um, studied, et cetera, on things for specific medical conditions. But what happens is society hears these things and sees that like, you know, in a study, oh, weight loss was one outcome that kind of happened. And we kind of get these blinders on it. And that is the see. And ultimately what is happening is we are really doing more harm than good to our diets in a sense. And really, again, these people that are advocating and sharing about them, some are health professionals, do not want to just are but a lot of them also aren't there are people who have had their own experiences and have been quote unquote successful um or unsuccessful and are sharing like why this didn't work and why this did work that they're preaching basically to society preaching to the choir that these things are good and bad and this all in this nothing mentality that we know when you can kind of sit on the the outskirts and kind of reject what we call this diet mentality that it's something that is actually not helpful these are really more rules and expectations and things that we're setting up for ourselves that ultimately, again, are putting us in more of a harm than they are good. Hmm. Okay. Well, so, so it sounds like what you're saying is that there's not a, there's not a one size fits all solution. Correct. But is it, but I know that there's oftentimes, it it seems like if just informally thinking about just general society, that a lot of people are unhappy with their bodies or unhappy with their weight. Is it sure. just kind of this allure of, oh, just follow this formula, do this thing, and we're going to solve this problem for you? Or, or what do you think draws people in if it's not actually necessarily the right thing to be doing? I do think it's a piece of that. I do think it is, you know, there could be some structure, there could be some rules that can be helpful for individuals. Um, I think, you know, you said it best. People are struggling with their weight. People are struggling with their body image. People are struggling with this idea that society is telling us we must be this, like, picture-perfect, thin 
idealized kind of person that is in there that when we don't feel like we fit in that box, we want to find a way to fit in that box. And there's no option for us to have like other boxes or for a box to not really even be present in that. And so it's ways for them to, you know, if you think about learning like a new sport or if you were to go do an activity you wanted, like you want to learn it very quickly so you can exceed at it as well too. And so you're going to try to do anything you can, individual lessons, practicing, et cetera. The same thing falls within these like nutrition and diet trends as they, people want almost like a playbook or a handbook of what to be doing exactly to expect the same results that they're seeing the people who are preaching about it as well too. And like Mm -hmm. you said, there is not this one size fits all for what you and you could do for your body. I could do the exact same thing and have absolutely alternative results. Absolutely no results within it all as well too. But if you were a person that is, you know, saying X, Y, and Z was so good for me and you should really give it a try, you know, it's you giving me medical advice. It would be like, if someone was like, here, try this prescribed medication. I have no idea how it's going to affect you, but give it a try. Cause it works so well for me and my, my anxiety or my headaches and whatever it may be as well too. But People see it a little differently just because we do, in a sense, have the ability to change what our body can look like or, or, or what people can believe it looks like. Yeah, it, it reminds me a little bit that it, it's always easier to tear something down than to build something up and a lot more complex, yes. too, to build yes. and to destroy. It makes me think about the fact, so I, I guess I, I wasn't planning on sharing my nutrition journey here uh, <laughs> ahead of time, but, but let's dive in, or at least the beginning of it, which was that I used to eat really terribly, and yeah. uh, and I and that absolutely had an impact on my health. I didn't even really mm-hmm. understand like the constituent parts of food until I got to grad school and uh, met my my now wife, then girlfriend, who was like, "You should probably get your cholesterol check," and and she said that because at the time. I, I, and I, I, I'm not making this up for basically all throughout undergrad, I would basically have a pepperoni calzone and chocolate cake for lunch every day. And who knew, you know, when you do Yummy. that, your cholesterol gets awful. I'd never, I had no idea what fiber was of soluble or insoluble types or any, you know, anything else. And so I remember at the time that I actually went to a dietitian at the university of Illinois okay. and okay. ahead of time they have you fill out like this, you know, like general food day. And between the mm-hmm. microwave hot dogs and the calzones and everything else, I literally <laughs> walked in and she looked at me and said, you suck at eating. And I was like, can, oh you, say that? can you say you suck at eating? That was kind of aggressive, but she was right. Yes. I did suck at eating. Um, and, you know, how to actually turn that around for me, probably, mm-hmm. you know, like my particular needs, but then also deficits probably look mm-hmm. different than somebody else too. Right. And like you said earlier too, A, absolutely. There's probably a nicer way she could have been like, you know, let's look at our (laughs) eating habits in some manner. I think that's where, you know, dietitians can get a really bad rep and do have a very bad rep, I'd say, in society. Uh, But you said it best. It's easier for us to like remove things and tear it down than it is for us to add these things in. And that's what these diets are ultimately coming back to is what can you remove? What can you avoid? What can you take away Versus like the the intention and the goals and the the philosophy that I really come from focuses on what can we add in and kind of seeing that it can be more challenging to be uncomfortable and have these things like microwave hot dogs and calzones and chocolate cakes and eat that while adding other things in as well too versus the diets that you'll see would say, let's cut that out. Let's no chocolate cake, no pepperoni calzones, nothing that you really like. And here's all these other foods that you probably have no idea if you have any pleasure around, preference around, but that's what you need to focus on as well too. Right, right, yeah, and I think we'll get more into this idea of restriction and and how how mm-hmm. useful actually is that as we as we go along. Um, but before we get there, while we're on the topic of we'll call it like people trying to modify their weight specifically, because I know that uh, weight and wellness are two different things. So they're not mm-hmm. some they're sometimes linked, but not always. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone was actually wanting to lose weight, whether or not it was related to a health condition or just because they like like to be at a, in a at a lighter weight. Are there actually, so what are the healthier ways to do that? If it's not a, a diet or something more prescriptive that, or we'll call it overgeneralized, where it's like a one size fits all, particularly, let's say, if someone can't afford to meet with a professional like yourself and get like mm-hmm. an individually tailored plan and they need to have more of like a general structure, is there a healthy sure. way to lose weight? Great question. I think my first thing that I would want to know is why do this? Why does this person want to lose weight? What is their intention around it? Is it from a body image standpoint in a sense that they believe and feel they're going to be more comfortable or they'll be more accepted? They'll be more confident. That's kind of there. If that's the side I would probably question and kind of ask them, like, are we, can we work on this side of things in the sense of, uh, again, our confidence, our body image is recognizing that we don't have to actually change our weight 
or weight is physically just a number that shows up on that scale and doesn't share anything about any of those things or health, let alone with it itself. Versus if there is that maybe more of like a medical reason that is there, there can be healthy ways to do that. I'm not going to go into specifics of like how maybe some what we call like weight loss doctors, dietitians, et cetera, may be because it's not things that I truly believe in or in or practice with individuals that I work with. But what I try to focus on is what we call these like health promoting behaviors and coming back to this thing of adding more into our day in intake versus kind of removing things and when I look at overall health, I look at nutrition. It is not, or excuse me, overall health. It is not just based on nutrition. So what that looks like in terms of how weight loss is as well too, is it's about nutrition, but it's also about our movement. It's also about our sleep. It's also about our mental health. It's also about our physical health. All of these different components that generally make up this idea of like, are we a healthy individual or not? Of seeing, can we work on those different components where nutrition falls into, sleep falls into, movement falls into by adding things in, adding more fruits and vegetables, adding more protein, adding more foods that we enjoy by you know if we want to be moving our body moving our body and if our body is meant to lose weight then our body will respond in an appropriate way we have this idea of a set point which i know we're going to talk a little bit more around as well too that we're our bodies are meant to be at to kind of function and, and, and perform at its best that if we are doing all of these like health promoting things and our body is meant to respond that way it will respond that way and for some individuals that can lead to weight loss and for some individuals that may not but we can still overall change your, your, your health and wellness within all of that too. So what I think I'm hearing you say is that food is part of a larger wellness system and weight yes. is part of a larger wellness system. And yes. if you put too much focus on one part, you're mm -hmm. missing the bigger picture. And as long as you're focusing on wellness, your body will probably gravitate to whatever it's supposed to be at. Maybe it's not exactly what you'd want it to be, but it's still healthy for you. Absolutely. And I think the term wellness can be a little tricky nowadays as well, too, just based mm -hmm. on the society that we live in, that wellness almost gets into like almost like another diet terminology as well, too. But generally, when we think of like our overall health and wellness being, yes, like nutrition is only a piece of the puzzle that's there. So if people are only focusing on decreasing their intake, counting calories, counting steps, looking at like the physical number on the scale. There's so many other things on this other side of things that could also be affecting where our health and our weight is at that may not be even things that we're touching on too. Oh man, see that- It's complicated. That, that, yeah, right, right, it's it's not simple. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of, and I, mental health is the same way. You know, like as a therapist, Absolutely. I think people are, are looking for a quick fix, but that's unfortunately mm -hmm. like what gets people into drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. is that like actually like there, there are ways to feel at peace or right. content but it might actually like take a little bit of work and like, yeah and that's why i see yourself. a lot of a lot of individuals coming in to see me is they want these quick fixes and they want kind of this idea of like or even in society how do i lose 10 10 pounds before i go on this vacation or how do i lose the weight for my wedding that's in three months and kind of looking at what is that really doing for us what are we really trying to kind of escape or kind of gain within that and can we look at kind of the bigger picture and see is there a way to just generally make ourselves how more healthful, enjoy our, our day to day that it's not feeling like we have to do X, Y, and Z similar to how someone can kind of like get into um, and struggle with mental health and going into kind of that drug and addiction side. Yeah, well, so you could either like really healthily reform your life or you could just drink nothing but apple cider vinegar all day, right? That's about, mm. I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's no, a big no, one nowadays. That would be, that would be it, oh that man, would be is terrible. it? I, that just sounded both disgusting and oddly healthy at the same time. It's probably not. Don't do that. Anyone listening, don't, don't do, do it. That. Please do but not let's... do it. So, so speaking of, so th there are some foods that we hear like you objectively like shouldn't eat or even subjectively shouldn't eat. Things like oils, right. sweets, processed sugars, processed foods. Um, are there anything that is objectively bad or is it all just a question of amounts or approach? Great question. I would say like any food that is spoiled or that you are physically like allergic to is what I'm going to say is like a bad food. Otherwise, no, there are not foods that are seen as like good and bad. A lot of it comes down to making sure that we are not having like only one type of food. And that could be what I, some people identify as these like less nutritious, what I like to call foods such as let's say the high oils, cookies, candy, things like that, versus these more nutritious foods, such as fruits, vegetables, proteins, et cetera. But we can also get really dangerous things happen to us if we eat too much protein, if we eat only fruits and vegetables, that both of them can happen, mm -hmm. but we only see 
from society that's focused on these items that people equate to, like influencing their weight or influencing their health as well too. So no, absolutely not. There are not good foods or bad foods, no foods we should be staying away from unless you physically have like an allergy, you're going to get some type of reaction and or they are, are spoiled or not good. So, so like in particular, I want to follow up on one because I hear some echoes of this in the more addiction circles as well about mm -hmm. sugar. And there's been a mm -hmm. lot of talk, particularly again, like added sugar or processed mm -hmm. sugar. Um, I mean, what, what what's your take on that? I mean, I understand everything in moderation, but at the same time, is that are there a lot of pitfalls around sugar? Like, what are you thinking there? I would say no. I think there are some people who believe that there can be sugar addictions that are possible. And I think that's where it really links up, especially in like the addiction side and space of things and kind of replacing it. Um, but ultimately, no, any food that we are not allowing ourselves to have, we can get an obsession around. The same thing could happen if you mm -hmm. don't allow yourself to have peanut butter. The same thing can happen if you don't allow yourself to have the cookie, the chips, X, Y, and Z, that that is kind of there. Um, just as any food that I would say, you know, sugar is not, sugar is ultimately a carbohydrate. It breaks down just the same as a sweet potato. It breaks down just the mm -hmm. same as a piece of whole wheat bread that's there. It's just starting in the simplest form that ultimately these other items, the, the whole grains kind of more quote unquote healthier carbohydrates that people equate to. All of that gets broken down into our stomach. All of it goes to the simplest forms that's there. They're just starting in different forms and have different amounts of them and nutrition that's really there. So so that's really interesting. So so you're saying like from your body's perspective, mm -hmm. carbohydrates are just carbohydrates. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily matter like where the carb come from. Sure, some might be carrying more nutrition along with it, but a carb is a carb Correct. is a carb. The problem is that you know, sugar in its sugary form, say, as opposed to a sweet potato form, mm -hmm. can be reinforcing from, say, like a psychological perspective because of the taste. And that's where things mm -hmm. start to come off the rails. Correct. A lot of times I'll ask my clients or my clients will come to me and say, like, you know, I'm so fine eating a sweet potato. I'm so fine eating a piece of whole wheat bread. But pizza is something that's really challenging to me. Cookies are something that's really challenging to me. Chips are something that is really challenging to me. And I always ask them and kind of when we look at building a meal, we want to always be incorporating some type of carbohydrate. If we were to switch out that source, so we have the sweet potato in this meal, you're feeling totally okay. We feel comfortable. There's no anxiety, guilt, etc. Say we were to switch that out to be, let's say even like hash browns, so a different form of a potato, or let's say French fries, that's kind of there. Would you be okay with it then? And more often the time, the times, the answer is no, because in some case and form, not only is like the food, you know, yes, changing, but also the mentality around it is. And so when we look at that, a sweet potato versus French fries, both of them are potatoes that are there. They're just in different forms and how we think about it is really what is the difference that's there. And French fries are, this food from society that is fried and bad versus a sweet potato has more X, Y, and Z and is a healthful version that it, it's our perspective and kind of our thoughts that really changes it. Too. But ultimately, both of them get broken down into the simplest form of carbohydrates in our body. Yeah. So, so it's kind of like there's there's this, there's these stories that we tell ourselves about food and our behaviors around mm -hmm. food. And Although it's true, you know, if, if you're eating too many oils, that could be bad for your health. It's not that, that oils are bad. It's just about how we're balancing them out. But if we say, oh, this thing is off limits, I can't have that. Or mm -hmm. um, I need to eat this much of this other thing, then you can start to create some habits around food that get you into trouble when it's the foods themselves, they just are what they are. You are absolutely correct. Ah, well, you're a great teacher. So. <laughs> you I'm See, gonna, I'm gonna give but you, it, you know how how i don't want to say how easy is it to kind of go around and get a, get that across but how challenging then when we see all these things in society where french fries are bad and let's stay away from them and sweet potatoes are on this good side of things how confusing is it how challenging is it to really understand like what am i supposed to eat how am i supposed to eat how much of things am i supposed to eat that it gets all very much intertwined and, and very confusing yeah, well, particularly around that that supposed side, I feel like as soon as you mm -hmm. start like having to walk a thin line or do something right exactly, right. then all of a sudden you've got anxiety, you've got stress, and then I could see how that could become a bit of a negative cycle if then you mm -hmm. might eat to relieve that. that Absolutely, could, that could get you into trouble. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, it's a vicious cycle that can go around and around. Yeah, well, and and the system, I I, I see why we work together. Mental health, absolutely, food, all, absolutely. All, all hang together. 
Um, well, let's let's transition into a different question uh, yeah. about, and I think we've touched on this a bit already, but around uh, eating mistakes, uh, where people have some view about eating and food or nutrition that we think is true, but might not actually have any basis in reality. I, I know one that comes to mind um, what is about multivitamins and that unless you're basically mm. vitamin deficient in some way, that multivitamins are basically just a massive placebo racketeering kind of kind of situation. I remember years ago, I was looking through uh, UpToDate, which is like medical reference software. And, okay. Um, they were talking about multivitamins in there, and they were basically tactfully saying, if you have a patient who feels strongly about taking a multivitamin, don't fight them on it, because it's not going to hurt them. Um, but at the same time, just know that they're probably not necessary. So are there, is there anything like that, uh, that, that the audience should know that a lot of people think one thing about, but isn't actually true? It's funny you bring up the multivitamin. I was just having a conversation with another therapist the other day about that of around a client who's kind of fighting it. And I was like, if they're not wanting to take it, like we have bigger issues and bigger things I want to like fight them on than taking this multivitamin right now. I would say another really big one is just like how much to be eating throughout the day. I feel like most individuals that I talk to, whether they're someone that is struggling with disordered eating or an eating disorder or someone who is is going on another path are not eating enough really in any manner throughout the day. They're eating very small amounts. They're eating very inconsistently, eating large meals once or twice kind of throughout the day. Um, society right now tells us that we need to be eating as little as possible. And we've gone through, I know I've like even looking back in my life with different stages and different years of like these different diets of again, low fat, low carb that we need to be removing certain items that is there that it all ends up kind of again, having less throughout our day that that is a really big common mistake that I kind of see right now. Hmm. Okay. So, so again, that sort of like labeling of foods, but also, so is there an ideal way to eat throughout the day or is it more just about listening to your body? I would say a little bit of both, you know, listening to your body is the most ideal. However, if you do not have a good like mind and gut connection that is there through whatever the reasoning may be, it can be really hard to listen to your body. Um, I also think a lot of individuals don't know what to be looking out for. And that's where like this educational piece can really come in to be able to listen to our body. Uh, many people believe like unless your stomach is rumbling when we're kind of getting like that roar that comes out that we don't need to be eating. And oftentimes that is actually our body's way of telling us like we are really hungry at that point. And it's given us a lot of other signals that we may not know. So if you can and know those signals and can identify it, absolutely. Listening to our body, knowing what's there. Our bodies and minds are really smart that they're able to give us signals and ideas of like what, not only what it needs, but how much it needs as well too. But we have to be able to like read those and give it back. If you are struggling on that side of things, often a rule of thumb that I will say, they really don't suggest that individuals go any longer than like five hours without eating. That's a really long time span to for a body to go without kind of getting any nutrition. I like to give the example of like having a campfire. You know, we have to put logs down, you put some sticks, maybe use some like um, newspaper, et cetera, to start this fire. If we get this like roaring flame, that's kind of there. Unless you continue to add logs and sticks and paper and et cetera, the fire is going to start to burn down and eventually just going to have the little embers that's there. The same thing is our body and our metabolism and our body, every other like system that's running in it, unless we are continuing to give it energy or those logs that is nutrition, it is going to continue to slay, slow down and burn down. And that's when we kind of see a lot of these other side effects that happen. Um, and the way that happens is again, where that four or five hours is typically when our body kind of needs another like recharge, which is why I'll recommend kind of aiming around that, you know, give or take, depending on your day, work, school, whatever it may be, if that's possible, we can kind of play around with that. For some mm -hmm. individuals, it needs to be closer together. For some individuals, it can kind of be that way. But I typically will, will say if you cannot listen to kind of this intuition side of things, using four or five hours as kind of like a marker, eating consistently throughout the day as well too. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense. I like the campfire metaphor. That's 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 very intuitive, and it also makes sense. I mean, our, our stomach isn't actually that large, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, like how how big is it actually ish for most people? Like, it depends and varies. I've heard different things that's like around the size of your fist. I don't know if there's actually research that's amongst it. Um, it grows and it shrinks as well too. A lot there there mm -hmm. is a myth out there that like when people lose weight that your stomach does shrink. It, it can be a thing. Our stomach is ultimately a muscle, just as all of our other organs. So it really varies for everyone. I wouldn't say there's like just one, again, not one size fits all. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. And, and there's the idea though, that your, your body needs energy, your body needs nutrients. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's kind of like swinging back and forth between having it and then not having it and having right. it and then not having it. Um, I know just, even just objectively thinking about, or not objectively, subjectively thinking about my own experience that when I go longer times without eating and I get really hungry, oftentimes I feel like those are the times when I overeat because mm -hmm. then I'm like thinking like, Oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. It feels so good to eat on like every possible level. And then exactly I'm, like uncomfortable <laughs> again. <laughs> and there's a whole scientific reason for that. I, I try to explain it. Like we have this tank of nutrition that our body is trying to fill at the end of each day. And when we're eating consistently, we're slowly moving that our body and our mind can catch up that when we know we reach about that hundred percent or give or take of where it's supposed to be at that we don't get more of those signals. Our body is usually at the end of the day. It's like, okay, it's time to recharge and go to sleep. And we're going to wake up and do it again tomorrow versus when we don't eat consistently or we eat very little and we're getting closer to our day, we still have a big chunk of nutrition that we're missing that's there. And that's why our body then starts to crave those massive amounts and we get so hungry because it's ultimately trying to just get to meet it's 100% of what it really needs as well too. We then have like specific cravings around that because our body's looking for this like fast, immediate kind of energy that often comes from those simple carbohydrates items that people will label as kind of more of like those junk food items. But there's a whole scientific like reasoning around why our body and our mind functions that way when we get to that point that we are so hungry. Yeah. Well, and it reminds me a lot. I've, I've really taken to recently liking the idea of our brain as mm -hmm. like a dog driving a car where you've okay. got this really intense, uh, you've got this really advanced thinking side of our brain that can do all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff other animals can't do but you've also got the more primal animalistic side the limbic system that sure. speaks through urges and desires and that that wants to basically keep your body safe and functioning in whatever mm -hmm. that means and so a lot of times when people make the worst decisions is when the dog takes the wheel of the car and is like we're uncomfortable that right example now. Yeah. We want to we, we want to fix this as quickly as possible, and it's not thinking long term. It's not even thinking like when you're done eating, how much did it's you like, eat? It's get thinking, me out of here right now. Yeah, like I need food right now. Um, whatever it is, uh, and then you start making like less thoughtful decisions, and mm -hmm. it sounds like it's that same idea is that that part mm -hmm. of your brain's like, all right, body's not in good shape. We got to fix this up. Let's drive this, you know, like let's drive this body over here. Eat some of this stuff right away, you know, and that's just what it does. <laughs> It's what it does. It's its body's, our body's way of just like trying to keep up. And it's our body's way of just trying to take care of itself ultimately. Yeah. Which is actually kind of cool that it, that it does that. Even if, if sometimes that means that we've got to learn how to speak its language. Um, right. But this, this is a good segue to my next question, which I know you also do a lot of work with, which is disordered eating. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there's, there's a very large uh, group of people in this country who have some sort of eating disorder. And I know there's a lot of parents who listen to this podcast who might also be wondering about uh, their own children, or, or maybe even people listening who are wondering about their own eating and whether or not yeah. technically it would qualify as disordered. So from a professional perspective as a dietitian, where do you draw the line between eating and disordered eating? And mm -hmm. what are some signs that you can look for? It's a very fine line nowadays, especially, and I feel like I keep coming back to like society and what's going on. And unfortunately, this, this idea of like diet culture and thin idealization and thin privilege that we, we live in right now has become so strong that it is a really fine, fine line that's there. I will ultimately say, I think a lot of where, where I would draw the line of disordered eating that comes to is how it's affecting your life. If your life is so affected that we are not able to do all the things, whether that means waking up and going to school and taking classes, waking up, going to work, waking up and being a child and going to play outside and play at the park and do whatever that else that may entail, if that is affecting your life and your ability to do those things, then it's probably something that is disordered in that manner. Um, I would say there's, some few examples that are pretty consistent among any gender that's there, any age that's there, this idea of being like preoccupied with food, preoccupied with our body, preoccupied with our health ultimately can be a really big side. And that the, the reason around that can be is that it, it really looks at kind of then influencing like are people starting to cut out certain foods? If we're preoccupied with what we look like, we're preoccupied with what we're eating and we are like, okay, I'm going to start to not eat. Um, 
carbohydrates let's go with for this that you know it can be a pretty quick domino effect how that starts with carbohydrates well maybe it's not fats and maybe it's not proteins and ultimately all of a sudden we are just eating fruits and vegetables um that it can be again pretty quick of a domino effect that happens I think another way is this idea of movement. We, again, live in a society that tells us we're supposed to be doing so much movement every single day and always moving our body. And we are quote unquote lazy if we're not in kind of the preoccupation of needing to do movement, um, especially if that is like they are going to do movements, going to the gym, walking outside, X, Y, and Z, like extreme measures. Some people I've seen are doing it when it's winter and it's zero degrees out and it's snowing or it's like days like today where it's 99 degrees and 100% humidity running along um i stepped outside earlier today and i was like this is ridiculous i don't understand how anyone is outside right now and you know walked myself right back inside but doing extreme things like that um that that ultimately brings up a lot of this idea of like anxiety a lot of this idea around guilt a lot of this idea around shame that's there as well too um i could go into more specifics but i think a lot of them come back to a lot of things that we think about in just therapy in general too like if it's affecting our life it's causing us anxiety it's causing us um to be removing a lot of things nowadays i feel like really anything sadly can be turned into like a disordered manner of things yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's so many ways. I, I feel like and this could be a whole nother discussion, how our culture mm -hmm. kind of shifted to almost mm -hmm. like create preoccupations and addictions. But right. it sounds like the core of what you're saying is that you cross the line into disordered eating when one, it starts to change whether or not you can function and live your life. Mm -hmm. but the other is if it's taking up like a lot of real estate in your brain and yeah. you're like always thinking about food or your weight or your body or what you're what you're going to eat when it seems like it's got this outsized role in your life rather than something that, you know, it's, it's not that you can't care about food. Like clearly you do, you make these amazing dishes, you spend time preparing it, but at the same time, it's not something necessarily that dominates your mind outside of work. Right. That way. Right. I often will ask um, individuals I work with of like, what percent of your day would you say that you were thinking about food, nutrition, movement in your body? You'd be surprised how high those percentage oft often are in over 50%, over 60%, over 80%, 100% of our day when on average, really someone who has a normalized relationship with food, a normalized relationship with their body, a normalized relationship with movement is really only thinking about those three kind of areas, about like 25, maybe 30% of our day, kind of these times when we need to be thinking about it. I'm recognizing I'm hungry for lunch. Let's start thinking about lunch. What am I having? How much do I need? Let's sit down and have lunch. I'm making dinner plans. Where am I going to go for dinner? Kind of those pieces. But it still leaves around 70 to 75% of our day for other things for our to occupy our mind, to take up our brain space that's there. Yeah, it, it strikes me that that's kind of like a like a privilege. Like I'd imagine that like animals are probably thinking about food like all the time. You know, like that's just Absolutely. Like, how am I going to live? How am I going to live? <laughs> but for us, we can actually like, it, it's self-actualized we can invest our, you know in, right in and, I, and i want to you know share too that for some individuals that may be higher depending on you know it is a privilege to think that way to depending on your access to food depending on your financial status and kind of can you afford the food that is available to you as well too and kind of that may increase depending on That's certain cool. environments and situations that you are in as well too but if we're talking kind of you know basics how do we know if this is becoming something that is disordered when we can kind of say those things are absolutely true when we factor that in. If it is higher than I would say like 50% of our day that it's it's headache in a pretty disordered manner. Yeah, well, well, and it's as we're talking, as you're explaining this, my mind goes towards like an organizing principle maybe to think about it is that if either anxiety, like I'm thinking, okay, either someone's worried about food and so it's really dominating mm -hmm. their mind or it's viewed as almost like a necessity for relief. Like I need mm -hmm. to, I, I need to be able to eat or eat this food or like something about food in order to feel okay, which is ultimately right. what gets that dog all revved up, you know, either seeking mm -hmm. relief from a problem, which is what it wants the most. Like the most important mm -hmm. thing for that dog behind the wheel is if you're uncomfortable, relieving that, but also in terms of watching out for danger. And both of those can really take over your brain. Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing it almost as like a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or if it becomes that way, as opposed to mm -hmm. what we can do right now, or like if it's just, you know, if it's just fuel for your body and you're, if you are in a fortunate place where you can afford the food, you can just be like, okay, you know, like, I'm just going to go to the fridge or I'm going to go to the store. Or it's not going to be that right. big of a deal. And right. 
so then I can put my brain on other things. Right. And if, if you are one that is not able to be in that privileged, fortunate position as well, too, recognizing like that, when I say these percentages, like that's on average, that is not for every single person in this one size fits all piece. Again, that's there when we can say, these are things that absolutely factor in and affect it. And it's not coming from a disordered place, such as I want to change my body. I don't like what I look like. I feel that I am X, Y, and Z that it, it can be a very different interpretation of kind of the, the amount of times that we're thinking about that too. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so speak, switching back to the parents for a second, I, I know that a lot of parents are concerned that they're going to miss signals from their kids and mm -hmm. about if, if they're having a problem. And, and clearly, we've, we've talked about some signals that you could watch out for, like if you heard your son or daughter talking a lot about specific foods or about their body or about mm -hmm. their weight. Are, are there other signs or subtle signs that a parent could watch for if they're thinking, you know, is this going on and I'm just not aware of it? Absolutely. A lot of one that I see in adolescents um, or even like young adults is lunch and kind of seeing like, are your children actually eating lunch at school? If you were packing it for them, if they are buying it there, um, if they're bringing it home, like, are they finishing it or how much of it is actually left? Do they eat one item that's there? Or are they purchasing it and giving it to their friends? That's often a time that they're not with parents or, or really supervisors. You know, there's teachers and people around that are at lunch, but they ultimately don't know like what they're eating the rest of the day, such as like breakfast, dinner, kind of snacks outside of school, that that's a time for children that are, they're away from kind of these, these love figures, these people that have a lot more knowledge that oftentimes they can be pretty sneaky at those times. And it can feel natural of like, hey, I'm not going to finish this. Then you have your friend at lunch with you. Do you want to have this? Or it's easy for me to walk the garbage and throw it away because no one's going to know. It looks like I'm just throwing my lunch away. Of, of checking mm -hmm. in around like lunch and, and an afternoon snack. Like often the children are getting out kind of at that perfect time from school where it is a perfect time for kind of that afternoon snack. If they're coming home and you know they had, some high schoolers have like an 11 a.m. lunchtime, even earlier nowadays. If they're getting home at around 3.34, we're going to after school curriculars and there it's been again longer than that five hour period of, of without eating are they just moving forward are they continuing to say like no i don't need to eat anything i don't i i'm okay and there's kind of like excuses and reasonings around that um i would say is a pretty other big sign as well too breakfast can be a piece of that especially too um especially if children aren't having it like at home or there's no one that is there parents have to go to work or the, they're bringing it, let's say like on the bus with them to school, there's really no like oversight to see if they're actually eating those items too. From your vantage point, is this something that you feel like a lot of young people keep private from parents or are parents often? Absolutely. Close? Yeah. So that people, so parents are not aware. Yeah. I would say a lot of times they're not aware. And a lot of times, unfortunately, when, when myself and I know a lot of like my, my colleagues and other, other professionals to see these adolescents is when it is further along the line and they are struggling. Um, I think it can be for a variety of reasons. I don't think that the parents are always to blame in any manner, um, disordered eating and eating disorders and just like mental health in general can be something for that is really challenging for younger individuals to express and talk about and be accepted i think we are in kind of this bigger movement this bigger push for parents and families to be talking more about that and getting more education which i hope will, will continue to change it but i think a lot of the times unfortunately it is kind of a, a secret and, and found out about a little too late not a little too late but a little mm -hmm. farther along the line yeah well and your point is really well taken about how if you can catch something early it really empowers mm -hmm. you to stop it before it like becomes malignant or grows and Absolutely. You know, this is really something where there's probably a reason why they're binging or restricting or whatever the disordered right. eating is and if you can address that early on and help cradle that a little bit so it doesn't the bottom doesn't fall out then it's a lot easier path than if things get really bad definitely and that was something that interests me and like switching to doing more of like an outpatient private practices for so long i worked kind of on the other side of this treatment side of things of seeing that there are so many more ways we can work to prevent this on smaller and larger scales that is there so so many people don't have to get to this other side like treatment is an option always but if we can prevent them from getting to that pretty intense and disordered place why would we not kind of be doing these things then mm-hmm yeah, it just it just makes a lot of sense and saves saves a lot mm -hmm. of suffering. Absolutely. Well, I, Absolutely. I've got one more question before we, we wrap up. Go We're for down it. to our about like last ten minutes, maybe a little less. Um so something that I saw on your website and I've heard some buzz about here, there, and everywhere, uh, is intuitive eating. Could you talk to us a little bit about what intuitive eating 
is how does it work? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked that because I think unfortunately now intuitive eating is starting to get lumped into this societal diet trend that's kind of there that it's important to come back to that this is something that is real and realistic and can be helpful. Um, intuitive eating is basically like a self-care version and framework around eating that is there. It takes this idea of like emotions, it takes this idea of our rational thoughts, and combines it with our own instincts, our own intuition that is there. And ultimately, with all those things and being able to acknowledge and recognize and apply those things, those three things together, we can meet our biological and our psychological and our physiological needs on an appropriate manner. It helps you there. The two people who created it basically um, have come up with those 10 principles that are there. And kind of as you work through it, it allows you to, like I was talking about earlier, kind of get to this place where you can recognize and have your intuition of like, when am I feeling hungry? How hungry am I? What am I in the mood for? When do I need to be kind of eating? That's there. But not having to be so structured and rigid as some of these other quote unquote diets. I would not say that intuitive eating is a diet in any manner, but more so a framework to give your body exactly what it needs and honor it based on what you want from it as well too. So does not recognize that there are, or it does recognize, excuse me, that there are not good foods and bad foods. One of the whole mentalities and principles is rejecting the diet mentality and kind of seeing if cookies and candy and ice cream and pizza and pasta, whatever we want to identify, is the food you like. How do we have that? And on our health kind of through other principles of nutrition as well too. Hmm. So, so, so if we want to test the framework, so say you've got someone who is eating really poorly and they they're, they're they're coming to you they want to use this intuitive eating if they're mm-hmm. like well well i just seem to want to keep eating pepperoni pizza every day or that my pepperoni calzones and chocolate cake let's let's flash back yeah. to you know 19 year old aaron or whatever i was um <laughs> i'm forgetting no we were like 22 or something but anyway um what, what would you say because like at that point like i really liked it right that's why i was mm-hmm. eating that every day but at the mm-hmm. same time i was giving myself high cholesterol through that behavior yeah. so um, it was very intuitive at the time to keep eating lots of lots of those foods. So, yes. so what? So, like, how how would you handle that? What would the the pitch be? Absolutely, a piece of it is again, what can we be adding in and recognizing too that like with this intuitiveness comes that we can have those items such as pepperoni calzones and chocolate cake every single day as well too. But can we have these other pieces that help it balance out? Can we honor our health and our, through like what, what um, the principal names as like gentle nutrition. And so when we talk about building and having a, a meal, we try to build a balanced meal. And so when we have that pepperoni calzone, can we add that's something that has some carbohydrates, maybe some protein, some like pepperoni, some cheese. Can we add some type of like fruit or vegetable? Can we add some type of um, maybe some other protein that's there, depending on how much like cheese and pepperoni is, is technically there, adding more into it rather than saying, let's take away the pepperoni calzone, let's take away the chocolate cake that's there. And as we add in more of those other nutrition items, as we add in other pieces of food as well too, oftentimes our mind kind of catches on to that and then it kind of gets the idea of we know pepperoni calzones and chocolate cake are always going to be here while they're just now as equal as these other proteins these other fruits these other vegetables that is there that we don't have to feel that we have to pick that it's one or the other that's there we can have both or we can have one at one meal there's nothing wrong if you were to just eat the meal of just pepperoni calzones and chocolate cake because ideally probably later in the day once we get to that intuition place, your body would be craving probably something that has some type of fruit, some type of vegetable, some type of protein that is there too. So a lot mm. of it is kind of working along the principles and kind of the different steps to ultimately get to this intuitive side of things so that we then can kind of apply that as well too. I see. So so what you're saying is that th- this is more of a long game strategy where if you've Correct. kind of like gotten off the track where you're not honoring the health of your body you're not really in tune with what it needs it's kind of just being driven into the ground by this desire for just something that's like very sweet very fattening that sort of thing Mm -hmm. as you intentionally start adding in more of these nutrients and adopting this framework of i want to treat my body in health with respect you sort Mm -hmm. of naturally start to see the pizza consumption go down in part mm-hmm. because if you're also eating fruits and vegetables, there's not as much room in your stomach for that, but also because your mindset for how you should be engaging with pizza and cake starts to change. 
Definitely, definitely. Um, and it is a long-term thing. It's not something that we're going to get a quick fix. It's not something in, in four weeks, someone's going to notice a difference that's there. It may be really challenging for 22-year-old you to try to add in some type of fruit or vegetable or different food item than the pepperoni calzone and chocolate cake that's there of, of working to kind of take those baby steps that it, it is a longer process that it can look like. And, and when I say longer, it, that is longer than what most people are hoping and kind of looking for as well. What this reminds me of a bit is, uh, so, so a classic book that I really appreciated um, and should probably reread at this point is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. I had to read that in grad school. I, I really liked it. I don't know if you did. Yeah. Um, but but it, what, it, what it struck me, I remember in the very beginning of it, he makes a point about saying how there's lots of books out there about strategies for like effectiveness and tricks and interpersonal things you could do to get what you want. And his his thesis with this, he was saying like, ultimately that's not going to work as well because people okay. might, they're, it's, it's fake. And really what that book was about was about changing character. Like what if we changed how you engage just generally like your whole mm -hmm. framework? And it sounds like that's what you're saying about with intuitive eating. It's not like if a diet is a strategy where it's like, oh, I'm just only going to eat fats with no carbs or I'm going to take out, you know, like, or whatever it is. Right. That's that's just like a strategy, but that's not really changing your relationship to how mm -hmm. you eat and how you use food. And intuitive eating is that. And once you do that, everything else flows from it. Definitely. Absolutely. It's a lot of it is related to our, our relationship, not only with ourselves, but with food and our, and our body and movement, but it all comes back to our brain. Our brain is so powerful. Our brain can controls basically our entire body. So if we are continuing to be in that mindset, let's say like the diet culture, weight loss piece of things, and we're trying to do intuitive eating, like we're, we're going to be kind of like butting heads here. They're not going to be puzzle pieces that fit together because they are so different that's there that a lot of it is coming back to kind of the mind now we can change the mind and help it connect more with the body and have that mind body connection that then we can kind of see this intuition that comes as well too i i always like to acknowledge when i talk about intuitive eating to that intuitive eating to a sense is also a privilege as well depending on like your availability to food depending on your access to food, depending on a lot of different factors that not everyone has the ability to have the full intuition to follow what we call these 10 different principles that is there. And so a lot of times, if, if that is the case, is looking at like, what can we apply? What is realistic to your life right now based on where you are at, what's available and, and, and how we can be working on that. So as much as possible, you can kind of get to that intuition as well. Fantastic. Well, that's, I mean, that sounds really good. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm personally there yet, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's sounds fantastic. And I think maybe I'll have to read that book um, or. You know, I definitely maybe. recommend it. They just came out um, in the past year with the fourth edition, which is the newest one that kind of updates it and talks about the idea of like privilege within it as, as, as well too. So I highly recommend it. I'm happy to educate and help you on it of course, as well too. Yeah, well, actually, so for, for listeners, I know you mentioned that the phrase intuitive eating is becoming a bit of a buzzword. And so like mm -hmm. the, the fidelity is getting a little or the integrity rather is getting a little fragmented. Who who are the authors who wrote the book that people should actually read to get the actual like from the source? Absolutely. I'm going to pull up their names so I don't butcher their names. Um, but there it's Evelyn Tribble and Elise Rett, Fresh. R-E-S-C-H. Um, they are the two. The new copy is like a um, yellow and green copy. Um, there are, so this is the fourth edition. There are other editions that are there. They all come and kind of go over the 10 main principles and kind of basics of there. So I would say like more of the details and recognizing like privilege and changing like different um, pronouns and kind of what it's using within the, the different editions that's kind of there. So if you do get access or find something that is of the, the like first, second or third editions that you can still get like the general concept, but I would definitely recommend it's a, it almost looks like it's like an ombre search the screen goes down to yellow and it's, it's by those two authors. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Now I don't know, know the one that I'm going to buy and I'm going to buy it because <laughs> they, they should, they should pay you for this or something. You just, I, so, so my friends, <laughs> my friends or other people will sometimes ask it, to use it or read it. And I'm like, you can read it, but it's like a, I almost like a, a textbook Bible for me at this point. I have it like annotated and have all these notes and stuff that I'm like, you probably may just want to get a, a clean, fresh copy because it's going to be more distracting of like all my notes and little comments that I have in mind too. But it, it's really good. 
Okay. Well, hey, I, I take your recommendation very seriously. You you clearly know exactly what you're talking about. And thank you for sharing all this information yeah. over the last hour or so that we've been talking. Is there anything that you'd like to end on? Something to leave the audience with before we say goodbye? I would say make sure you're eating enough throughout the day. Always be open and willing. A lot of my clients will joke. I, I have this question I always ask, like, are you not are you not wanting, but are you willing to do it? Are you willing to kind of give it a try? Um, and when we kind of can go with that mind space, mind sets with things moving forward, you'll be surprised of what you can actually try to accomplish. So I would say those two things. And thank you oh. for having me. Well, of course. Thank you for being here. That was immensely hopeful and helpful and a lot better than my tip, which was the apple cider thing, but we're just going <laughs> to, um, which we'll go with it. No it's better. Do. I don't know if it's better or worse than some of these. There's like a, a TikTok trend going on right now that is sparkling water with balsamic vinegar to help make like a healthier version of Coke. We'll throw it in like that category with things. Healthier version of Coke. What Coke are people drinking? If that's what it tastes like. Oh my gosh. Like does it... it's, it's crazy awesome. nowadays of what people are coming up oh. with. The Wild West. All right. Well, thank you again, Libby, for joining. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We will catch thank you all you. again soon.